Alice Cooper was born Vincent Fernier. He grew up in a religious household and spent his formative years in Arizona. In high school, he excelled as a track and field star, but he was inspired to try his hand at music when he saw the Beatles make their historic appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. Alice, how did you grow up? You're the son of a preacher. Yes. Protestant. My granddad was an evangelist. My granddad worked with the uh, uh, Sioux Indians. He was a missionary with the Sioux. My dad was a missionary with the Apaches. And I basically spent every weekend up on the Apache reservation going to church. You know, I was, all my friends were church kids. I was the prodigal son. Were you singing at that time? Did you sing hymns? I, and... It was at the 13, 14, 15 is when the band started. So 14, I started singing locally, which kind of was a ripple, you know. But my dad was very cool. This was the British invasion. Every week there was a new band. There was the Kinks, the Yardbirds, the Who. You will remember because you were in that era too when you were going, wow, where are these bands coming from? The Beatles, of course, was the point on the arrow. Um, and I would sit and watch this with my dad. My dad would be shaving, right? And I would say, I'd open up the Bible and go, Ephesians 3, 42. And he says, and the Lord said on to, uh, right? And I'd say, okay, um, Luke 2, 8. He says, and Jesus said to them, da, da, da. and I'd say, who plays bass for the, anim for the animals? And he goes, Chaz Chandler. And I go, my dad is really hip. <laughs> He's cool. Well, he went, he says, I love the music. He says, I can't stand by the lifestyle. You know, free love and the drugs and sleeping around and all these. He says, I can't certainly abide by that. But your show and the music, I have no problem with. Our radio was always on. My parents liked, really liked rock and roll. They had no problem. They were a big band, of course but they liked rock and roll. And so the Beatles came along and all of a sudden, oh, my dad's, oh, guys are really good. You know, they, they weren't the, uh, you know, shaking the fist, uh, don't ever do that. Of course, when they saw the Stones the first time, they might have been a little shook. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly the Beatles were fine, you know, not realizing that I was already thinking, I'm gonna make the Stones look like choir boys. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> well, well, let's pick up the story. So you go to college, you go to college in Arizona? Well, hi, the band started in high school. Right. At 15 is when the Beatles first came out. And that was that summer where I just went, oh, I got to do that. I just love that. You know, that music was so different. It was the first time I'd ever heard a band that played and sang together at the same time and wrote their own songs. You know, you just went, wow, that's totally different. And then you saw them again, and the Beatles just kept coming out with great songs. And pretty soon I was on the track and cross country team with Dennis Dunaway and John Spear. And that summer, John learned how to play drums, Dennis learned how to play bass, I decided to be the singer. We found the two biggest juvenile delinquents in the school that both played guitar, <laughs> and we had a band. And we started playing little parties, not ever realizing where it was gonna go. Your band's been going since you were what, 14, 15 years yeah. old? You're trying to make it big. Yeah. Wasn't working. So the, what happened? Well, the only way you could make it big was to go to L.A. You had to go to Los Angeles. And we figured, we were pretty cocky. We, we figured we were awfully good, and nobody had this kind of theatrical edge that we had. And so we went and auditioned at every single club there was, not realizing that we were the best band in Arizona against the best band in Wyoming, Illinois, Michigan, they were all there trying to get the same jobs we were trying to get. And we literally starved our way for about two years. Every record company turned us down until Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa saw, uh, listened to what we were doing and he says, I don't get it. And I said, what do you mean? He says, I don't get it. And I said, well, is that bad? And he goes, well, no, I'm signing you because I don't get it is that was, to him was amazing that there was some band out there from Arizona of all places that was doing something that he hadn't thought of. You know, uh, he was the maestro. Frank Zappa was sort of like the, looked up to by everybody. He was the maestro. Oh, he was huge in the business. Frank Zappa was not just making fun of the politicians, he was making fun of the hippies. 
<laughs> the very people that were supporting him. So he was totally unique, and for him to put his brand on you was a big deal. That gave us, all of a sudden, we were kind of looked at differently. Well, I want to ask you, you grew up the son of a preacher, of a pastor. You had a pretty typical, very good childhood. Yeah. But the question is, where does this Mr. Hyde personality come from? Do you think it's a, a, a somewhat a revolt against your father and the strict religious doctrine? My dad wasn't strict. My mom wasn't strict. Um, that was the thing. I think it was, I saw as an artist that rock and roll, horror, and comedy were all in bed together. I mean, horror and comedy, uh, to me, the scarier the movie was, the more I was laughing. You know, I was going, this is so over the top, it's hysterical, you know. Uh, add rock to that, and let's see what happens. And to me, it was a natural thing. It just was so natural for us. The very first show, the earwigs, in high school, we were the earwigs. We put on Beatle wigs, we had our track uniforms on, and we did parodies of Beatles songs. That very first show, there was a coffin on stage with a guy coming out, and there was a guillotine. And that s somehow followed us. <laughs> it just was always there. Because I think that we saw, understood that every bit of this horror that you saw had a punchline to it. It had a comic relief to it. And you couldn't be a villain without getting it in the end. You have, the bad guy's got to get it. And there's a relief to that to the audience. But at the same time, the audience was laughing too. They got the joke. 